All right, you all. So we did take a quick look at this previously and your uh, text chapter reading, the one labeled chapter nine works on this as well. Which is beginning to look at analysis and interpretation in a science and anthropological point of view to begin to shed more light on what things meant to the makers, not just us, but to the people that actually created them. There are multiple approaches. We are going to take a look at cognitive archeology, span which uses science, which is collection of empirical data, right? Things that can be measured, quantified, and that other researchers can go through the same measuring collection quantification process to correspond their results with any other particular person or group. So ideas. All right, firstly, as a real quick little series of definitions, wordy stuff for you. It focuses on understanding with a better sense of it being relative to the ancient population or the creator population or the user population on the ways that ancient societies thought. And within thought, again, culture is a mental construct. So really what we're studying anthropologically and archeologically for the past is the material that's left behind. And how do we use those materials in order to investigate symbolic structures? And as we'll take a look at as we go through this, where could we obtain this type of data to understand thought or meaning behind symbolic items? And the term here, structure, doesn't mean buildings necessarily, right? It means the mental um, set of ideas, purposes, uh, reasons, and the things that help us to arrive at a conclusion with our population that we all understand at the time. So a cognitive archaeologist is somebody that's really mainly focusing on taking a look at the role that ideologies and organizational approaches would have had on ancient populations. So why is organization part of this? Because what you allow or what you construct or what you support in a human culture is a mental framework of the best way to solve problems that you currently know how to do or that you can concurrently cope with. And those ideas that are mental constructs then get manifested in material culture, in the material remains. If a society, for example, accepts that leadership and authority is something that an individual, perhaps just one individual, should have only in times of need, then that's an abstract idea. Because as we know today, there are other societies that do accept the framework that an individual or small group of individuals might be allowed to have organizational control, power, or authority constantly. So this is a little bit the direction of where we're going. Next here. 
though, that we're not just assuming that all of you have had a course or had some uh, time to spend thinking about uh, where mental constructs come from or how embedded they are or any of the other um, baseline things that we're looking at here. Let's look at just a couple more uh, definition points. So humans don't just behave under the influence of senses, but we also do this through past experience and patterns or experiences as we grow up. This is not, as many of you already know, completely unique to humans. We see this in other mammals and other sorts of species, but for our class, we're gonna just stick to humans. So experiences that we have individually, but really importantly, experiences that we have as a um, group per generation. So as each individual grows, learns, becomes functional, a participant, a parent, then the things that the group works on together and the meanings that are assigned or that you learn about and that they accept, right? Part of the definition of culture becomes a cognitive map, a pathway that helps to define what things we should all be paying attention to constantly, what things to our group or to our gender or our generation we don't need to worry about or even notice. And if things are happening or existing or are defined as reality, how is it that we are to act in sync with that? A cognitive map. So as those of you who have had uh, more or a lot more of anthropology have already found out in other courses and perhaps some other um, disciplines as well, groups of people that live together tend to develop a shared view of the world. And therefore their cognitive maps are going to have a lot of similarity, which is going to influence their group material culture. A good example of something that you're looking at as you go through reading and um, learning in unit three here would be taking a look at the difference between the style and building and shapes of residences at a site like Ain Malaha in the ancient Near East when they have not begun to grow their own food versus a fairly short period of time later, the format of the community, the shape of the houses and the distribution of structures at the same region when we see that people are now farming. Really interesting change. Doesn't mean we've always come to a good, strongly supported conclusion about why those changes happen, but you will see this as you're reading through. So the shared map or worldview alters over time and we can see that archeologically. From unit one, our first things that you took about in class, the rise of processionalism, right? Not just wanting to identify how old something is or where we can find it or counting or an inventory, but really looking at um, the ways that we can determine to the best possible change over time and the role of science as we do that. Our approaches have become much more scientific. In other words, we're paying more attention to not just what we have found and how that relates to things that we know about, but what the context of those materials or images or right, artifacts, ecofacts, features, communities, and then take a look at all possible interpretations for those. So an example of this might be to discover from the Upper Paleolithic something that's called um, 
a commander's baton. It looks like a small handheld vertical heavy duty, not really a club, but something that we might also in some cultures called a scepter, a club, something like that, serves a purpose that we are not completely aware of. If we use or work within the cognitive archaeology framework, in order to move towards a more meaningful conclusion, then we would need to begin by evaluating all possible functions for it. And then it would be very clearly defined on what, when I say procedures, what types of analysis? Would it be the materials? Would it be the shape of it? Would it be the size of it? Would it be looking for comparison of similar items? Any place else that's close, far away, similar in time? All those aspects, really, really, spending a lot of time doing the compare contrast and see how that relates to any other data that's coming from the site. So when we do that, when we're using scientific approaches and we're applying data-driven logic and also experimental evidence. So again, maybe this commander's baton might be something where we really really want to use experimental evidence and figure out exactly how it was formed, carved, molded, figure out exactly what kind of, if it's wood, tree that it's made of, and whether or not you can make something that looks just like it from other materials, or does it have to be unique to that particular source? When we do that, we start to move much closer to the most likely functions, isolating what's most likely to be the cognitive role of that item, that place, that image for the people that created it and were using it. What did it mean to them? So taking time and doing empirical research. All right, so let's go back then to looking at the Upper Paleolithic. This can be done from time and place all over the, all over the map, but uh, we are going to use this particular grouping of uh, materials as our case studies for thinking about cognitive archaeology. You already looked at previously that uh, for some of these communities, we're finding the remains of portable objects for murals, for images that appear to be animals, appear to be symbolic or geometric, and so forth. So let's take a look through the options for explanation for the use and function of those images, symbols, and portable objects. So probably the most famous to the general public are the so-called Venus figures. Even just the phrase Venus figures tells you that initially no scientific method at all was used in order to give them a name. Um, so let's go through and uh, take a look at this just briefly for a moment. Let's get a little closer here. Because these figures have been shown in museums, photographs, documentaries, and many, many, many art history classes for a really long time. Um, the, all, a huge number of people on the planet have seen at least some of these, in particular this one here, which is called the Venus of Willendorf. So found right now in modern times within the region that would be closer to modern day Germany, for instance. And maybe like you, I've even seen things that you can purchase for craft websites or even instructions from crafting websites where you can purchase copies of these that are 
crocheted, that are knitted, that are felted, that are stuffed toys, and so forth, and all sorts of different sizes, which is really fascinating. Now, in this particular set of images that I found, an artist and somebody that uh, probably was clearly um, well-intentioned took this image as a drawing, or looks like maybe a watercolor perhaps here, and said, to me, this looks like it was intended to symbolize or portray a real life biofemale. It has very heavy full breasts, is very heavy in the buttocks and upper thighs. And then there's something going on around the head where the face is not shown, but does look like perhaps it could be a cap, curly hair, maybe braided hair, and then the artist put it together in a couple of ways. But why do I wanna show this to you right now? Let's look real closely one more time. Something that we mentioned before. Look at the skin pigmentation of this particular human. Look at the facial angles or phenotype of this particular person. Small, dainty, pointy chin. Particular decision for the bridge of the nose. Color of hair. All right, if we're going to move towards looking at something like the Venus of Willendorf, we need to, oops, to be very careful about not looking at them and saying, oh, that's me, that's mine, that's us. What we know from other lines of scientific data is that this would not be particularly accurate skin pigmentation. And that form of chin and nose, probably not particularly accurate. And the original artisan didn't intend it to look like a person at all. That was not the purpose. So let's look at this one over here. This is another here in the center and from two angles on both sides. This is another one of these so-called so labeled because the labels were applied in the 19th century uh, Venus figures. Now in this case, the creator did want to show a face. Right, so there's something here with some easy hatch marks on it that again, a different artist, not the same ones we looked before um, in drawings thought they might show, well, if it's hair, maybe the hair looked like this. If it's braids or beads or something that we might in everyday English call uh, the cornrow braiding um, be like this or attaching beads to it, maybe it looked like this. Maybe it's a cap on the hair. But again, the artist that created this showed sort of a different set of facial angles and orientation than what the artist actually put together. And there's nothing here that would indicate skin pigmentation or hair tone here. So again, all this is guessing and it's really not something that's probably the best option. So when we see these portable figures, the first thing historically that's happening with the people that go in these caves or find some of these objects, they're not usually making uh, targeted excavations in order to do this. Um, but once they see them and they're looking at them, drawing them, photographing them and that sort of thing, they are initially just linked to our own culture, that a small handheld figure would be art. So that is the oldest possible explanation cognitively that a person, individual people were expressing their own creativity. So again, getting back to the why, right? Cognitive archeology span is addressing the why. Why were they created and why in that material? Why at that time? Why with that particular perspective? any of the whys you can think of. 
So their assumption was that during the Upper Paleolithic, like now, that humans need to express themselves, that individual desire to create using what we know today would be our own mental images and then make that into something that you can share your mental image with another person. But what you created is you. It's a version of how you see, how you think, how you value, that that was what was going on. Now, what's wrong with that particular hypothesis? Again, we're looking at cognitive um, archaeology as a way of making informed, testable statements and then collecting data so that we can do some work with that. So of course, some of the things that would be problematic with this is that we are assuming that there's a value that's there in everybody as they grow up, but that they learn is important, is a something that you're supposed to do, which is to see yourself as an individual who is unique. As you know, in the modern world, there are many modern day, even urban societies where children growing up are raised to see themselves as a cog in the wheel, as one individual, but really your identity is the entire family or the entire region or the entire country. And where expressing what they think individually is not something that is uh, that they're supposed to be doing. And in some contexts, they are punished for that. Um, or it is uh, pushed down. It's not something that you're supposed to do. So that's a possible, but it's not something that we can really con confer exactly. So the art concept, going back to those innovations list that you were looking at with your reading and that we mentioned before, Right, so from things that you might, you'll be able to find on in Canvas for you. So um, the Upper Paleolithic, a uh, little bit of embedded read there, art, jewelry, things that could have been worn or sewn onto your clothing, woven into your hair, right? There are a lot of other ideas that might possibly be there. Just, it could be um, imagination, it might be personalizing things, but it may be something more practical. So the art concept, not necessarily the best match for these societies. We don't have any way to really confirm this. And we do know, though materially, that they are living in an exceptionally challenging landscape where finding food, very challenging. Surviving the colder part of the years, very challenging moving around on the landscape, especially during um, the uh, cold times of the years, but even worse, probably during the, wa the warmer parts, because we know there are so many other uh, carnivorous or hunting species um, that have senses, right? Odor, hearing, and so forth, that humans don't really have any match for. So perhaps thinking of these things as being mainly just about expressing who you are as an individual, might not really be the strongest match for influence of creation. So we looked at this one before, which is generically um, listed as a commander's baton, but it's in the form of an erect penis. But you can see again that somebody has spent a pretty good amount of time making all these tiny little notches in lines and then making these holes through it so that it could be tied onto something, but it also could be hanging down from somewhere, might've been worn, could have been held, might've been attached to a handle. We need more context, right? We need to look for more data. Okay, now what's another why? So innovations characteristic of this, there are things that have symbolic identities to them, again, thinking of cognition, what's important, why are they making them in the format, the size, the images, things that are more practical. We do know using science that these counting systems or calendars are basic technology. This is in the need zone, not the creativity zone, but the need zone to have awareness of 
coming and going of seasons, how many weeks are left before you're going to see the change of the availability of certain species of migratory birds, animals, um, fruiting or leafing out of plants, plant species that are making um, seeds that you're going to want but aren't available all year long. So we also have a strong data set that these handheld objects have practical uses that are part of the everyday. There's more data in regards to needing these small handheld objects that have some surface alteration or decoration as being used for practical rather than personal uh, meanings. So this is probably a stronger direction to begin to think about for analysis, that we are looking at basic technologies that are meeting everyday needs for individuals, perhaps the group as well. What about the use of some of these let's say images, painted caves, things that are carved, um, small figures that might have the appearance of animals or animal horns. What about the hypothesis that these were used for rituals about hunting? So what would be the supporting data about Upper Paleolithic handheld objects or images or things that seem to be symbolic or icons about their role in hunting, food getting, subsistence. All right, one of the lines of supporting data for these that would take a frontline approach is that we know that a huge percentage of their diet during certain parts of the year is going to be related to hunting animals. Not all of it, but there are a tremendous amount of data sets of the butchered, heated, fractured, and thrown out animal bones. We do know that the majority of what they were hunting were larger animals. It does seem to be in certain regions that they preferred bigger animals rather than smaller. Doesn't mean they didn't eat the small ones, but it does mean that there was a lot of learning tool making, planning, and processing of particularly horse and a number of deer-like species. So in these images, the majority of the known images of any format are animals. Yes, there are some Venus, so-called Venus figurines. And in fact, even just giving them that title means that original people that looked at those, those uh, female figurines applied them to their own modern Western roots. And the people look at them, saw them, and didn't see something practical, didn't see something that was a friend or a neighbor, saw them with their um, enhanced perspective of breasts and hips and upper thighs, and immediately assumed that bio males would find this highly attractive and be related to their definition of females, the way that they wanted them to be, the way that they needed them to be. Huge problems with that, of course. Your college students, you probably knew that part right away. All right, so the majority of known images, let's say in painted caves, are animals. Of those that have been analyzed accurately, which is pretty much all of them. There are a lot of people that this is their main uh, type of study, whether they're purely archeologists or some related fields. And the majority of those are preferred for meat and materials. How about materials, right? Like my group of Magdalenians behind me in my screen, screen share image, the, the need for clothing, hats, boots, warm garments, blankets, really warm things to carry baby and toddlers with, uh, right? Because this is the Pleistocene. So they've got a, every month of the year is colder 
than what we experience in that region today. So some of the animals that they're hunting may have been more about hides or perhaps some of the other materials like horns, tusks, bones, and so forth, even than for meat. We do know that most people during the Upper Paleolithic did live out in the open, and we have found some uh, community remains that shows that using animal hides along with rocks and sometimes very large animal bones or tusks um, is how they built these small hut-like structures. So the leather is as important as the calories. Those that are very fast, very large, have very large horns or tusks. Those, again, that for humans would be categorized as dangerous are generally placed statistically, right, using now data, further back, further away from the entrance of the cave. So you wouldn't see them until you had been in there longer. You wouldn't see them until you were in areas that didn't have any extra light coming in. And there's gonna be some other things going on as you proceed through on these pathways that we're gonna look at in a few minutes, but they are generally further back. Here's an interesting note. Some caves do have large numbers of images of certain am animals, for instance, mammoth, in places of the entire larger zone where we have found very few bones of that particular species, where that's not something that we're even finding out in the open. So are they a memory? Is there something that you didn't see all the time, but you saw on one travel? or movement? Again, questions we have to resolve. So again, we can't just say, well, they hunted animals and a lot of the images are species that we do know for sure they hunted because there's these other scientific or empirical questions that are not fully addressed cognitively. So right, so cognitively, why are they including? Why do these with these particular images why are they placed in a different spot? So are you thinking in the direction that, oh, okay, if they are separating certain species into certain corners, caves, regions, further away, closer in the front, then it isn't just an image of their territory. It isn't just an image of what they see when they go outside. There is something cognitively worldview values or perhaps ritual awareness, right? Non-practical, non-eyes going on. Let's move forward. This is a big one, you all. So aggregation. Aggregation is gonna be something that you see as an important concept for Gobekli Tepe in ancient Turkey, younger than what we're looking at in these examples, but still in extremely ancient. And many of the other case studies we'll look as we work through the second half of the course, aggregation. So what if these handheld objects, these images, sculptures, so forth, are really mainly serving a role for something socially important? We do have very, very strong data and very, very um, well examined and shared and significant amount of archeological field work, publications, research and projects that look at particularly the rock shelters and the so-called decorated or painted caves as a focal point for social activities and the term for that would be aggregation sites. That not just one group made them and uses them, that multiple families or small scale um, communities are all coming together in and around this and that the presence of those, let's say painted caves or 
go back to the campaign, serves a huge number of people who don't normally see each other or interact on the month to month or year to year. So what would be the supporting data to move our analysis and our um, focus of collecting data, analyzing data to aggregation or social activities? Well, here's one that over, because right, we've, we've mentioned last time that we have a more than 20,000 year database of the use, um, creation, entrance, and you know, ability of people to know where they are of these caves. Because you can keep finding them, even if there's um, something that goes on where the trees change or the patterns of a uh, river or movement of glaciers or something going on with animal species or so forth changes, these would be known spots on the landscape. So they would be giant markers that information about where they are and how to get there seem to be passed along generation to generation. We know from the ability to extract data and we looked at direct dating with AMS last time and indirect dating with the uranium um, uh, signature coming from the deposits over the painted surfaces. That'll tell you that everything under that um, deposit is older than the deposit, plus some um, excavations within the caves and also in other sites that have been found around them, that these were um, places that people were aware of and did use and reuse over very long periods of time. With, there are a couple that have been very recently discovered that no one in modern times have been in. And the most important of those is the cave, and you've got it uh, mentioned briefly in your case study on the Upper Paleolithic, that the opening to the cave is underwater now. So as the ice age ended and glaciers began to melt, then the ocean levels came up. So blocking or drowning the pathways or the transitional phases to go and get in them. So one of these was actually discovered by super uh, adventurous uh, underwater cave divers, I know, super scary, who came up and stuck their heads up and saw as they came up into a chamber that was not underwater and doesn't look like it had ever been underwater, painted images all over. Being very, very awesome humans, they did not get out and do much in there. They just went back down, marked it out and reported what they had found. So then when the scientists finally got in there, they were able to see everything and there are footprints in that one. That's also the one that has images of penguin. <laughs> Incredible, um, right? And uh, so much data, so much data because nothing's been removed or replaced or walked over or right any of the uh, carbon deposits or other things that we talked about last time. Uh, so those footprints in there indicate many sizes of visitors that that people again the entrance probably bio males and females and sub adults. The fingerprint or finger mark data that we've collected for some also, right, because they're making a lot of these, especially symbols using their fingers. They're also using brushes and some other sorts of techniques. We also talked about finger fluting in the moon milk of Rufignac and so forth. And then also lamp storage, the fact that they're storing the lamps there. They know they're gonna come back later. They know that they want that to be there so that they, when they get there, they're ready to go in. All they need to do is get the animal fat and create the wicks, probably something that all of them knew how to do throughout their entire lives. So a lot of supporting data from artifacts, ecofacts, from just the formation of them, that these are 
aggregation sites for groups of people to visit and revisit over long periods of time. So aggregation starts to emerge as one of the more supported conclusions of the purpose, the why of these materials. In, let's see. Yeah, we have time. We can look at this for just a couple moments. In this series called Ice World, and I embedded a few of these uh, in Canvas, there are some sections there that also take a look at Dolni Vestonitsa, which is also one of your case studies. It's the community. It is the community that has the multiple structures. They found the clay figures. There is um, burial remains. They're using the mammoth uh, bones there. So that's a site where you just want to know where it is, how old is it, and what did they find there. Um, and in this particular section of it, it illustrates aggregation as a topic. So we're just going to look at a couple of minutes um, for this one. I'm going to go. We are so versatile that we can deal with almost any challenge. When things change, we are simply able to cope better than any. Okay. In, in Ice Age Europe. Just before we get started here, in this program, it was produced a while ago, but it's really well done. And you're going to see some things that are more scientifically accurate. So when this group of three individuals, they have to leave where they were living because in a series of not the best decisions and a really hellish winter, everyone in their original group of only about 30 people dies except for these three. There are two young and healthy adult males and a young, very healthy adult female. The, they, and so they've given them names humans everywhere around the world that we know of have names. This is our species. So there's no reason why they don't do this. So the female's name is Mara. And then one of the males is her partner. The other male is her partner's brother. So they are a family. They leave their area and they are well aware that when another winter comes, if there are still only the three of them, they will not be able to collect store um, and have the right types of foods and materials that they need to live. That if it comes winter again and they don't move and meet up with another group that they will freeze to death or starve to death. So this the show shows them migrating from spot to spot. So we're just gonna pick it up right here where going down river and uh, we know well prior to the time frame of this program that humans in a variety of places made and used boats. We don't know what the boats looked like exactly. We just know that there were crossings of people, say for instance, from Southeast Asia to Australia that could not have been accomplished without use and knowledge of moving around and traveling in boats. Okay, so they are they coming down this river, they see another larger group. It is the better season of the year. So they stop because they are um, meeting up at an aggregation site. This isn't where this group lives full time either. This is aggregation. Being sociable isn't a choice. It's a necessity. Individuals have no long term future. They have to become part of a group. Mara and the others are trying to charm their hosts. The aggregation will be ending soon, and they want to be adopted permanently by one of the groups. Come on. 
While the weather is good and food plentiful, the visitors are welcome. But with the prospect of another bad winter ahead, none of the clans will find it easy to absorb three new members. The only person with any long-term value to them is Mara. The chief wants her to join him and become his woman. Mara knows she'd gain from this arrangement, but without her, Aki and Bran would find it even harder to be accepted by any other clan. Mara has made her choice. The travelers have no future here. This God, this is God. Aki, Bron, and Mara are leaving before dawn, stealing as much food as they can carry. Once again, they're having to journey into the unknown. Okay, so again, um, one of the, one of the reasons why, um, yeah, they can't translate the they made up a language for this. But one of the reasons, again, that um, thinking about this and just seeing it real briefly lately um, is good. And you all are university students and um, are probably um, of a generation and a cadre that is a little bit more uh, aware of how often when we are looking at interpretations or reconstructions of other societies, ancient periods and so forth, that just the modern viewpoint of who we really are and what we want um, or how our society functions bleeds through on these. But in this one, the um, contributors to the program were archeologists, anthropologists, uh, right, uh, people that were more science scene oriented. So one of the things that you did see is they're casting. They are casting a group for this one that is much closer um, in facial appearance, hair, that sort of thing, to what we know is going on genetically, um, not only from the bony remains, but also the DNA tracking of this. And that is, if you remember last time, people had only arrived into this of exactly us, um, only approximately about 40,000 years ago, but their pathway was originally from North Africa. So we really would be seeing more individuals moving from north of the Sahara, perhaps, or really further south, uh, East Africa and so forth, moving into the Arabian Peninsula and then coming around and moving into what we consider uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, and the very Western part of North Asia today. So better casting with that. Also, they're really emphasizing in this program, extremely important as you read through, nobody survives in these groups if both or all adults, bio-male, bio-female, any other gender identifications, because while we might have certain um, predispositions or dispositions or you know value judgments about gender we know that the non-western world is much more aware of biologically all the varieties that humans typically come in some aren't as common but yeah but this is frequently something where we're dead wrong on that as well. And many of us growing up are always seeing programs or reconstructions of things where, bio males are the ones that everybody needs and the females are just sitting around either breastfeeding or preparing dinner and they all die you all most of the tools uh, the largest amount of calories and a huge amount of 
other work that we see that we can study scientifically from uh, mobile forager hunter gatherer societies around the whole planet is conducted by bio females most of their day-to-day -day calories however in the ice age um, if it is bio males hunting these larger animals then right they are at extreme risk um, con uh, uh, constantly so in the program yeah mara decides to stay with aki and braun and then they eventually do find a group that will take them in but it's a group with a different sort of social consciousness so again aggregation is when groups of people who do not normally interact during the year have a meetup spot that they're going to go to and exchange mates partners uh, trade celebrate conduct certain rituals um, and that sort of thing R really essentially county fair right those sorts of things and we know that very common around the world all right let's look at a fourth way of thinking about them and one that is extremely powerful today and the ted talk that's in canvas also takes a look at this social theories not just aggregation but what is the role of altered state of consciousness when they are interacting uh, creating using or um, benefiting from these materials benefiting from the experience. So in case you haven't taken a look at this in another class, but I will um, mention just in case you have some more uh, semesters going, um, the course that I spend the most amount of time looking at altered states of consciousness and the role of that and how that fits in with a completely different uh, worldview is actually my course called Cultures of Mexico, which is about ancient Mesoamerica, because their entire definition of reality um, embeds altered states of consciousness into part of what's considered real. We don't know to what extent that's also accurate here, but these are the things we do know. Rituals incorporate uh, that they are conducted, that incorporate moving into an altered state of consciousness is nearly universal in human societies. In other words, anthropologists or other types of visitors or people that live in inside these societies, um, very, very clear. There are many ways to achieve an altered state of consciousness. If you're living on the landscape and even in a cooler environment like Europe, you've got fungus that will achieve um, that will make changes to your brain chemistry. There are some animal species that might have biochemistry that will do this. Um, fasting will do this. Exhaustion will do this. Meditation can do this um, and other types of rituals. Self-mutilation will do this. So there are lots and lots of ways. We're just gonna look at one, but again, on the TED Talk, she's gonna talk about a few. What we do have that's very strongly supportive of these so-called art, which includes the caves, as being primarily important because of social considerations is that going inside the cave triggers something called entoptic phenomena. Entoptic phenomena. I'll just type it so that we will just have it on there. and optic phenomena. So it, like interior, optic, optic nerves. So this has to do with things that are gonna get triggered to the way, to the information your brain gets from your eye. There are right now 32 symbolic identifiable icons or signs that are repeated constantly over time and through all basic localities where we found any of these types of objects, paintings, murals, that sort of thing. We do know also, and in English, we use the word shaman for the individuals that are the most practiced and that conduct these rituals or these events. But um, right, being culturally 
conscious is so important. And I learn new stuff every day and you all are as well, hopefully, and all of our friends and neighbors uh, around the place. The term shaman is an actual word from a Siberian ethnic group. So whether we pronounce it shaman, shaman, et cetera, we are pronouncing it in English. So don't get too worried and don't listen too much when people say you're not pronouncing it correctly. So we took that word into our vocabulary when anthropologists began to study those societies and just because there's no word for this in Western society because we don't have specialists um, or the, um, yeah, we just don't have the vocabulary to really talk about this. So this would be within animistic ritual systems Things are alive more than just humans and that things that are alive have a consciousness. They are aware, they play a role in the universe. So in these animistic religions with shaman or what we would call shamanic type activities, then the goal is to be able to get out of only considering what your natural eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and touch can experience and get into the bigger inventory of real or alive or present. So many of the signs that they found in these upper paleolithic um, inscriptions or paintings are in common with those that are reported from many continents and many different ethnic groups when people achieve an altered state of consciousness. So the fact that the signs themselves, those symbols overlap and they are something that a person who's had the experience reports seeing or knowing, this is extremely powerful data, right? Now we're able to look at something from a scientific manner and say, okay, what signs when, where are they, how are they linked? And what gets you into being able to experience those? The, there's a really big inventory, but frequently what you'll see as examples or what you're already aware of are dots and dashes, right? So dot, 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 or the long, long, long ones, grids, zigzags, or, right, so zigzags, grids, spirals, and then nested curves. All right, so it's not so common right now, but if you are aware or a fan of um, classic uh, animation, like coming from things like the um, Roadrunner, that kind of generation, some early Disney does this um, and so forth. You are aware that frequently when they have something where there's a lot of action going on, if somebody gets bumped in the head, they turn around and it shows their eyes with spirals going on inside. Or if somebody is right in some of those where they have explosions all the time, you, they'll look and they'll see things all around them going zigzaggy or radiatingly. Um, this is the full grown adult um, illustrators choosing from their background inspirations, these extremely ancient signs or symbols that are associated with when your brain, your nose, your eyes, your ears are overwhelmed and are not producing, right? The information or the data that they normally do. So that, and a lot of times we'll hear like a tweeting noise and 
and that sort of stuff spiral in the eyes. There were many cultures where when we see an image and it looks a little bit like an anthropomorphic face, that the eyes have spirals or grids or something else going on inside of them. It tells us that their eyes don't work like ours. Okay, so. All right, okay, so what we can say empirically, scientifically, with great support, is that there's a clear commonality between the action of what in generically in English we'll call hallucination or the achievement of an altered state of consciousness with prehistory geometric motifs. Modern experiments show that these, get a little bit bigger here, show that these geometric forms emerge from certain biochemical characteristics in the brain, right? Everything that you know and feel is a chemical, but that's being interpreted or stimulated from electrical impulses coming from other places in your system. So scientific literature now indicates that images that are drawn by people, and it doesn't matter when or where, during or directly after they experience these altered states have a really a really recordable inventory and they are often equivalent to people that have visual challenges during for instance migraine headaches or during prolonged visual deprivation during so-called near-death experiences. And you know what's going on with near-death, right? You're suffocating, right? Your cells are not oxygenated. So your body is starting to shut things down because you don't have blood or it's not circulating or your heart can't beat um, or there's a toxin or something else in there that's causing it to not do what it needs to be able to do. Ingestion of psychedelics. All of these things will generate some of these symbols that we see over here to the side. Or during direct electrical stimulation of the brain. Again, that's when you get into full experimental mode where people are not um, are participating. We see them on boulder sculptures here. These are from Ireland. Um, the inventory includes again, right, nested um, zigzags, grids, spiraling things, spiky type lines. They can be curvy waves, they can be angular waves. It's very, very clear that this is part of the mammalian brain experience. So we could consider that if we understand what circumstances trigger it, then if we see them in carvings, figures, art, paintings, and so forth, that that is strongly supported that they are aware of that. So here, this inventory here, these are from Ireland, uh, much younger than the painted cave. And then these over on the side is from a, um, a research study from uh, recorded when talking about people, what they their eyes were recording when they were hallucinating in a more, um, when they knew what the source of the hallucination was. Okay, so what do we know for sure is going on in those painted caves always? And that's over here. Prolonged visual deprivation. When you go in there, there's not very much light. And even if you take a couple little candles, as we looked at last time, they're lighting up almost nothing and they're flickering. As you move further and further back in the cave, it's darker and darker and there's less noise. There's less, less whole sensory deprivation. It's not a full sensory deprivation room or tank, but it is working in a similar manner. 
So ent optic, now this is just looking specifically when it's something that's triggering these neurological symbols, signals from the eye. The eye is looking, but the, the um, impulse that's going to the brain is being altered and then recorded or trans, translated uh, in a new manner. I'm not even gonna say incorrect, right? Because the nature of reality is defined by your own culture and experiences. So we know how to trigger that. Flickering light, repetitive motion, exhaustion, psychoactive substances and sensory deprivation. And that this is a constant in human or mammal nervous system in any culture or any time frame. It's how our body works. So they go in there carrying flickering light. We know that there's a level of sensory deprivation. We don't know what they were doing before they went in. Were they having a little bit like we saw in the Ice World uh, video before? Were they having an evening or a day where they have a central uh, drum circle going or a rhythmic beat or a hum, a whistle or flute hum? It could be with your voice as well. Think the sort of things that you might see in the more traditional um, coming together, beginning or finishing of things like some of our powwows that still exist that you can watch online or go visit to. Um, we see this in video or visits or participation with many world cultures where people stay up all night, moving around, usually not fast, with a step, 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 step for hours and hours and hours all night long. We know for sure that many much more recent cultures did those sorts of things with the steady beat, with a, um, a sound that was not a, didn't have words, didn't have a melody, right? Just like you saw with the, the whistles, the who, 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 going around and around and around and around and around as part of the preparation for the battlefield, getting to another state of consciousness where perhaps running into battle and knowing that you are going to be injured, die, kill, injure, um, maybe, uh, and uh, right, we know for many of some of cultures that they even went into battlefield naked except for their weapons, that there's the need to prep the consciousness before that. So these caves certainly would do this, even if you didn't plan on it, they certainly would do this. So here's the thing about these symbolic elements, and this is how they interact with the animal images, perhaps directly related, perhaps not. Um, but the meaning of those signs is not something that we will know. What we can know for cognitive archeology span is the activity that produced the signs. What were they doing? They were coming together. It was multi-generational. It was multi-gender. They kept their equipment there present. They visited them, improved them, changed them. Um, came back over very long periods of time. They were making some images of things that were exactly part of the regular natural world, but there are other things in them that are not exactly part of the regular natural world. So um, the, the specialist in the TED video that you have embedded, her last name is Von Petzinger. If this is very interesting to you or part of your major or so forth, she has an entire book on this, published in 2016, The First Signs, Unlocking the Mysteries of the World's Oldest Symbol, where she used science, comparative research, and so forth, and looks into this particular, uh, this particular subject. Okay, I'm going to...